So we are going to talk about how to facilitate English language learner success at the university. And Ekaterina and I, we both work at the intensive English program here at this university. So we work with, um, with international students, but also with um, residents who are also English language learners. So uh, just like in you know, many universities in this country, our university has lots of resources and materials and services and programs to help English language learners to become more successful at the university. But the problem is that sometimes students uh, and even teachers are not aware of these resources and they don't really know how to utilize those resources. You know, when it comes to students, uh, they may just, you know, uh, maybe just, uh, uh, you know, uh, they have different universities. For example, I come from the country uh, where the university was totally different from, you know, uh, US universities. So we only had one building and that was considered campus. So I don't really remember that we had any of the services that we have here, for example, at USU. Or students have different academic expectations, for example. Or they may also be intimidated, you know, especially language learners. You know, uh, you know sometimes I hear my students say, oh, I don't really, you know, you know, want to go to the library because there are so many American students there and I feel like, you know, I'm not very comfortable there. So they may, uh, uh, they may feel intimidated as well. Or they may also feel like all of these resources that we have on campus are not for them, they are for domestic students. So those kinds of problems. Some other uh, difficulties that they have may be related to their, maybe their status as international students. Uh, for example, for those students, especially for those students who are coming here for the first time, and that might be difficult as well. For example, it could be their first experience in a different country being away from home, so that could be very hard. Uh, culture shock, something that is very, sim uh, very uh, familiar to all of us. And different academic expectations, as I mentioned. Uh, for example, that was difficult for me as well to adjust to you know, certain uh, expectations in the US university you know, uh, opposed to the ones that I had back home. Some adjustment issues, uh, you know, simple, uh, you know, as simple as climate <coughs> or food or interaction, uh, or interaction, everyday interaction with people. Uh, for example, I had a student last semester in my uh, writing class who has been here for um, two and a half years, so he finished high school. So he has been, he, he has been here for a while but he told me that he still has problems adjusting to food here. So that was quite interesting to me to hear that, you know, he has been here for quite a while but still has problems like that. So that could take, you know, some energy as well. And also language, of course. That could be uh, difficult for them. And also sometimes they have financial challenges, you know, you know dealing with all the, you know, things that they have to buy and most, you know, most of them are uh, teenagers or, you know, uh, young adults and they uh, have to deal with those um, problems as well. And visa problems and other paperwork, sometimes uh, it could uh, get in the way uh, as well. Uh, accommodation, especially for those students who are uh, living off campus, right, so finding a house, dealing with some, you know, issues like contracts and things like that. So that could be uh, very new for them and also quite challenging. So uh, before I move to the next slide. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, that would be um, pretty unfair to kind of shift all the responsibility onto, onto students by telling them, well, we have so many resources here. We have so many programs. We have so many services. Just go out and explore. Because just, uh, they just, as you see, that uh, they have to deal with so many things, especially during their first year or even a couple of years. Even our, even our American students or uh, you know, uh, uh, our uh, residents, domestic students, they may have problems as well. For example, I remember when I taught uh, a mainstream composition class, my students were, you know, my students, all of them were Americans. They told me that they don't know what, what, what uh, services and um, uh, materials we have on campus, just 
Well, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why we do an orientation for them at the beginning of the semester, but still, there's so much information and they just get too overwhelmed. Or think about your first semester of teaching at USU. You were kind of trying to navigate everything, right? So a lot of information. So basically, uh, this is not fair to shift you know, the responsibility on students. And we are the ones who can actually help students finding those resources and using them for their uh, benefits. And why do we have to do that? Um, why do we want them to become more integrated into their local academic environment? Well, from the uh, perspective, from the um, uh, perspective of the second language uh, socialization theory, there is a close connection between language and, and context. And if you, uh, if you look at this diagram here, so language is basically a possessor of, you know, uh, of capital, of all resources and everything that's available out there. So in other words, the more students, uh, uh, the better students know the language, the more resources they can access. And on the other hand, language is the result or language acquisition is the result of participating in those you know, activities and in the environment. So in other words, uh, the more students participate, the more they get integrated in their environment, the better their language becomes and they acquire more uh, linguistic forms. So that's why we do talk about um, integration and socialization into the local environment. So how do we do that? So there is you know, simple ways to do that and I'm gonna show you you know, uh, the most simple one is kind of providing the information to students when it's applicable. For example, you can tell them about the Writing Center and all the resources that the Writing Center provides. You can talk about library and all of the resources that they have, including databases, and you know, showing them how to use those databases and telling them if they have difficulties, they can go and meet with the librarian and they can help uh, them as well. We also have something that's called tea time or conversation groups for English language learners and every semester they organize uh, those conversation groups once a week. Um, so I don't know what the schedule will be this, this semester but usually they do it in the afternoon, Wednesdays or Thursdays, I'm not sure exactly. But it's a really good way for students as well to practice their English, to talk about different cultural issues and things like that. So this is kind of, or, and also there is a, a, a quite amazing resource in our university, uh, it's called Academic Success Center, which I became more familiar last year when I started teaching here at the university. And it has um, very rich resources such as handouts, different strategies, how to take a test, how to prepare for a test, and things like that, like about learning preferences and learning styles. That's a very, very good resource for students as well. And they also offer different workshops throughout the semester. So you can look at the schedule and see what, uh, t uh, what the topics are for the workshops. Kind of a more subtle way is by inviting uh, you know, different guest speakers from all of these services on campus that, uh, that you, know, you think would be more applicable uh, you know, to your students in your class, or organizing tours to those uh, to those services and I also invited lots of guest speakers from different organizations on campus and that was quite helpful. And finally a more integrated way is by actually implementing those resources into your course and this is something that I would uh, talk about um, today and I will show you how I implemented those resources into my syllabus so how I included them uh, in my course. So this is the class uh, that I taught um, last fall. Um, I will give you a brief overview, but of course I don't have time to sort of go in, you know, into detail about the class. But the class that I taught was, uh, uh, was intercultural uh, communication or cross-cultural talk for uh, intermediate uh, level of proficiency of students. And so basically this class focuses on language fluency and on um, interaction with American students. So I had four American students in that class and they were helping my students to interact and do some group work. 
So in that class, I had five units, and you can see them uh, on the left-hand side here of the column. And I also, for each unit, they also created a project, kind of, you know, uh, as, you know, for each, for each of these uh, units. So each unit kind of dealt with uh, a, certain, uh, a certain level of the local environment. So for example, we started with the classroom, with our classroom, and the first unit was called Building a Learning Community. And for that uh, unit, they created um, a project, kind of um, introducing their uh, group to, other, uh, to, uh, to the other students in class. Which, is, uh, which was called Our Group Profile. So they created a group portrait or, or a photo uh, slideshow or a skit, or somebody created like a, like a poster. I don't remember what exactly was on that poster, but kind of uh, the, um, the, uh, the, proje the project for that unit uh, varied across all the groups that students have, uh, that um, were in my class. And then we moved on uh, to our university environment, so from the classroom to the university uh, level. And we talked about education, and we also uh, uh, did the project Exploring USU, which I'm actually going to talk about. And then, and then the students created uh, a group PowerPoint presentation for that project. Then we moved on uh, onto the uh, uh, city level and talked about our local uh, town, Logan, uh, that was for the unit globalization. So we talked about, you know, what changes our city is going through uh, in this time of globalization. And the students, um, and, and the, project for the, the project for that class was leading a group discussion. Then the next one was, you know, moving even uh, on, on a more broad level. Uh, on the state level, we talked about the environment and students also created uh, a poster, a group poster about Utah's national parks. So they had to do some research about national parks, uh, you know, looking at different uh, environmental features of all of these parks and create a poster. And then finally, we talked about the nation in general and fashion and styles. We talked about, you know, what Americans wear, what their outfits are, and students actually created where, or we did this kind of fashion show where they you know, uh, came to class and they had different situations. Uh, they had to prepare different outfits for particular social events that people have, you know, such, such as a party or a wedding or things like that. So just, it was, um, and it was quite fun. So you can see that um, we kind of moved from the classroom to the university, to the city, to the state, and then to the nation. Mm -hmm. And then we used a lot of, a, a lot of resources. So I just wanted to focus on the second one since it's, uh, you know, it's, it's about how to use the resources that we have on campus. So what, uh, what this project was is that students, they were working in groups and each group had uh, a certain category of resources that they had to explore and then present on those, on, on those resources. So we had four groups and the first one was, uh, was presenting on academic and professional resources. So students uh, got familiar with library, writing center, career fair, special lectures, workshops, and seminars. So some of them actually went and talked to people, or some of them actually attended you know, certain special lectures. Uh, some of them went to the writing center, and you know, they did this presentation about academic and professional resources. Then another group was um, researching on social and cultural resources. Things like student organizations, clubs, social <coughs> and cultural activities, volunteering opportunities. And so once again, they also uh, created uh, a nice presentation. And then the next one talked about athletic and recreational resources, like sports facilities, recreational facilities, athletic competitions, and outdoor programs. And then finally, uh, the fourth group presented on student services, such as CAPT, IT services, disability, di disabilities resource center, an Office of, of Global Engagement. So students, um, it was an eye-opening experience for most of them because they really were not familiar with most of these resources and programs on campus. So they did a really good job and they said that it was, it was also helpful for them. Um, so obviously, to kind of wrap it up my part, um, obviously I do understand that all of you are coming from, you know, from various disciplines and maybe you're not 
dealing necessarily with uh, so many international students, uh, you know, in the same class. So that's why I wanted to give kind of uh, to give you some general suggestions what you, uh, what you could do in your classes uh, if you happen to have ling English language learners in your classes, or even uh, even um, you know. Uh, what do I call them, regular or domestic students. They can also benefit from these resources. But like I said, guest speakers, right? So you can invite uh, guest speakers. For example, uh, at the beginning of the semester, you can invite somebody from a writing center so they can you know, kind of give a tour or a short orientation to the writing center, or uh, someone from the library, or a person from student organizations. Then from student organizations. Then in the middle of the semester, you can bring someone from counseling services. That sounds about right. In the middle of the semester, can help students or from volunteering organizations. And then kind of toward the end of the semester, you can bring a representative from an academic uh, success center, the one that I told you has a lot of resources on how to take a test and how to prepare and test taking strategies. And it's an excellent resource. So that, that's uh, about guest speakers. Then you can also uh, ask students to do different surveys on campus, and that could be also implemented in your class. For example, if you're, if you're talking about a certain topic in your class, you can ask students to go out and maybe ask other people on campus, such as staff members or professors or TAs or even students, asking them you know, a few questions about this topic and they can come back to class and they can share their experiences as well. So I've done that many times and students are at the beginning very intimidated because they don't really want to talk to other people that they don't know, but you know, they just um, come to love it. Library tours, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a great uh, resource as well, I mean, uh, by which I mean the library. So you can arrange um, tours either with a librarian or you can assign a self-guided tour to students. Just make sure that you structure it, you know, that the students know where to go and what to find. So I've done that. I, I, I've done self-guided tours and that worked quite well as well. And then photo scavenger hunts could be quite fun, especially in the time of, you know, uh, smartphones, that all students have smartphones. For example, if, you, um, if you're covering a certain topic, um, like I, I have a few examples here. For example, if you're talking about globalization or effective marketing technique or certain, ar certain architecture design or different engineering projects, it does really depend on your, on, on your class and your discipline. Then you can just ask students to go, to go out or to walk on campus and maybe take photos of an object that represents that particular concept or you know as many pictures as you require. Or something that I also did for my students uh, when we talked about libraries and how to find books, how to find articles, I would give them a, you know like a series, a list of call numbers from, from the books in the library or a list of the um, of the of the book titles for yeah the book titles and I would ask them to go to the library and find that book on the shelf and take a picture of that book. So they would be learning how to navigate the library. And you know, that's about um, photo scavenger hunt. And also small scale classroom activities and homework assignments could be uh, quite helpful as well if you, you know, if you implement those resources. So you, so you don't have to do a full-fledged project in your class that kind of, you know, help students to gather all these resources. But small classroom assignments will work as well. And I also wanted to show you something that we created for this particular presentation. So if you go to the website of this conference, and if you find our presentation, and if you click on ELL, which stands for English Language Learners Additional Resources, it will take you to um, this page, where um, I kind of compiled two different uh, folders. The first one is online resources, and the second one is other resources and advice. So if you go to online resources, so you will see lots of different resources for your language learners. For example, the first one says online writing labs, then the, first, uh, uh, the second one, punctuation online resources, then from sentence to essay resources, 
and things like that. So all of these resources, so you, if you open it, you will see basically just, um, um, I'll just show you one so you can get an idea. So basically for this one, it's five free online writing labs. So you can see those are my favorite writing labs um, online. Um, you can just read the description and there is a link so students can go and you know, uh, get access to those resources. And for the second one, uh, other resources and advice. So those, they're kind of, uh, they have a kind of odd uh, numbering here, but you can see one and then two. So those are specifically, once again, for English language learners, you know, something like strategies to become a better reader or how to overcome writer's block. So when you open each of these files, they're all in the Word document. So once again, you will see lots of different advice, you know, suggestions and advice for students. So, um, so once again, you can um, just go to the university. Um, so, so for you, you, you can go to this conference website and you can just click on. All right. So now um, I'm going to, yeah. To Katya. <coughs> yeah, that's the short name for Ekaterina. I know it's really confusing. It doesn't sound the same, but <laughs> that's what we do in Russia. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's now talk about uh, graduate international students, okay? And then can I uh, just ask, get an idea, how many of you actually work with graduate international students? Can you raise your hand? Oh, graduate international students? So international students who are graduate, just one person, two, maybe two, okay. And then graduate international students who serve or who work for you as TAs, teaching assistants? Oh, okay, at least, okay, we got a few, okay, good. All right, guys, so basically before, uh, after they get here, right, so international graduate students, we give them uh, orientation, okay? And that would cover the cultural orientation, the language orientation, and the teaching orientation, because most of them, uh, they get a teaching assistantship, right? Some of them would switch to research assistantship, but it may change, right? But many of them get uh, a TA-ship, okay? And what we try to do is to address the potential challenges they may have as TAs, right? And this is based on the literature. On my experience, I was also, as you can guess, an ITA some time ago, right? And also based on my conversations with them, right? So those, uh, many of those issues would be same or similar to what Elena was talking about, right, the undergrads, but some of them would be specific because they're also teachers, right? So many of the challenges they have is uh, as teachers, as like regular teachers would have, right, like novice instructors, so instructional challenges, right? And we try to talk to, about those, like uh, kind of preview the, the potential challenges they may have and give some strategies how they can deal with those, right? And then on top of that, because they are new, right, to the culture and uh, to the language, they would have also linguistic and sociocultural um, issues, right? Okay, and so one of the ways is to talk about this in the workshop, right, kind of prepare them for the challenges, uh, talk about the solutions. And the other way, uh, this is uh, something we are working about uh, now, is creating open educational resources, OER. I think that sounds familiar, right, to most of you. This is kind of the recent like, hot topic, right, in education. So the online resources that are available for everyone, not only to this university, right, and they are free, okay? And this is a series of um, videos we are creating in our program and I use them in the workshop. I also, students can also access them before the workshop, right, or after if they want to review anything. And I want to show you, there is a link here. Basically, it's on our website, the Intensive English Program, okay? So, um, so there is some information about the training we offer and then so far it's still in the development stage, but so far we have um, a video, a teaching sample, right? And this is uh, Yen Han Lin. Uh, he was a PhD, he is a PhD student in uh, plant soils and climate department. And he's giving a teaching sample um, uh, on the topic. So it's very informative, but at the same time it is engaging, right? So he prepared some jokes. He uh, pays attention to student reactions. He asked them questions. So I think this can be, well, it's not, nothing is ever perfect, right? But I think it still can give them a, a good example of what an interactive uh, American classroom may look like, right? And he's an international student from Taiwan, okay? 
and then uh, the other videos are a little different. So they are interviews of my um, kind of favorite, I shouldn't say that, my, <laughs> my best students, okay, ITAs. And we have one uh, from Jordan in, in engineering education. And then we have uh, another uh, two females from India, also in engineering. And then we have one from social sciences from Russia. Okay, so giving you a breadth uh, uh, of countries and also different dif disciplines, right? They're more like the hardcore sciences and the social sciences. And they talk about uh, the challenges that they had and how they tried to uh, handle those. And then uh, the insights from experience. So I interviewed those who have been here for a while, okay? So they have experience as TAs. And the last one is advice for new ITAs, right? And then, um, yeah, of course, if you work with those students, you can always talk to them, right, just in person. But I think these videos can also be informative for you as faculty, but also for the students, okay? And um, what actually happens in the workshop, that would be my next slide. Can you help me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what we talk about is the instructional challenges, uh, right? And for that one, um, we do teaching practicums. So something you sim similar to what you saw in the video, right? The 10-minute the ten uh, ten teaching sample uh, by the student from Taiwan. Um, and then uh, we, they do the same. So every day they prepare a, a teaching presentation and they get, get feedback from me, from other instructors, and from their peers. Right? And sometimes we also video record uh, those lessons and then they see and reflect. So this is a very common practice in teacher education, but they really find it really useful for them. So that's what I understood. And then, um, yeah, another one is guided as discussion facilitated through instructional videos. Basically, I use those videos we have. There are also a lot of YouTube uh, videos, right, of American classrooms. And oftentimes, uh, they find it different from their countries, right? So in some countries, it, there is a more traditional approach, right? It's more teacher-centered. And here, you sh they should expect stu uh, questions from students. They should ask uh, students questions. Sometimes ch uh, students would even challenge, right, uh, your authority, your opinion, so, and they should be ready for anything, right, basically. Uh, the linguistic challenges, um, some of it is, I think, similar to what Elena was talking about. So we talk about the compensating strategies, right? So if um, their English is not as perfect, right, as they want it to be, they can always use more visuals, right, when they teach a class. They can use the board, right, to write the keywords. They can just honestly acknowledge, okay, my English may not be as perfect as yours, so please correct me, right, if I make a mistake. If you're not, if you're not sure what I'm saying, uh, please ask me. So kind of having this honest, dialogue with, your, with the students, I think it helps. Um, and then also we have some data where uh, it's called corpus, like a collection of language. Um, they compare native speakers and non-native spe speaking uh, IT, TA's language, and they can see the differences in, um, with native speakers and what they should be aware of. Um, and the last one would be sociocultural, right? So um, for example, in the concept would be, it may be, may be funny to you, but office hours, right? In some countries I know students from India, their professors teach, teach so many classes, they don't have time for office hours. Or maybe they don't even have an office, right? They just have the teacher's lounge. Uh, so, but this is so common in the U.S. context, right? And for that one, we also have role play. So I would have one student playing a TA and the other student, and they would kind of practice, and they also give them some language, like common expressions that they can use in those conversations. Yeah, so I guess I'm done. <laughs> oh, there is also, yeah, there is also a handout that we can, that you have, right? And there are more resources there. Maybe I can, can you open? And it would be also on the website, the same where Elena showed you. Maybe I could just highlight um, a few things. Uh, so the first one would be online resources for ITAs, okay? This is like uh, what we cover in the workshop, but these are additional from University of Washington, a few other like online uh, places that I found useful. The second one would be resources for faculty, for you, right, working with ITAs. And um, for example, if you have to observe them, right, what, uh, how you set this observation cycle, right, that they have materials for you. And of course, there are books and there are articles. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And do we have time for questions? We have about three minutes for okay.
Do you have any questions for us? <laughs> it might be a little bit off topic, but I find that one of the things that block integration in the local culture, in the local culture in Logan, is very much outdoor activity. And that requires skills and equipment that a lot of, a lot of the international students don't have. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any resources that help them kind of more easily integrate into that? Um, well, I know what we do in the intensive English program, right? We have those hiking days and canoeing, and so we try to provide them and like teach them like the basic stuff. So we do this in our program. I'm not sure. I think they have a, a center where you can rent equipment yes, on campus, outdoor right? Center. Outdoor. Um, yeah. So that's. I'm not sure if there is the new, um, anything else. Stadium. They also no, have it's a building. It's the building. It's the whatever the new building is. It's on the corner there. Yeah, recreation, whatever. The students can only use it. And they also have like outdoor programs at the university, and they offer lots of different outdoor activities throughout the semester, or you know, like especially in the fall semester. So I usually uh, tell my students to go to the uh, to the um, calendar of events, and I show them how to use that calendar because it has like different categories of different activities and events. And if they want to do something outdoors, then they can see that there are some different schedules. And those activities are always supervised, and they provide like different, you know, types of gear and resource, you know, and resources for them mm -hmm. to actually, you know, participate in that particular event. There, there are also one credit classes that students can take, you know, fly fishing or whatever, rock climbing, mm -hmm. things like that. And those are supervised. Maybe someone who knows nothing about it. They have lots of resources within the math department, from tutors, individual tutors. Uh, they have uh, online things that you can take to learn math without actually taking a class. If you want to take a class, you're not qualified. So, sorry, you get enough, so I probably need to share. Yeah, we're, we're real tight with time. <coughs> um, so I'd like to thank our students.